hello. Can you hear me? Sort of. Well, Brother Fate, I hope you're happy. We're all sweating now. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Uh, On the interpretation of 1260 days, let me refer you back to Don's message this morning. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but his feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Uh, For the 42 months, let me refer you back to Don's message this morning. (laughs) He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword, he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. 
He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so they could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also first forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. There are two groups of people here tonight. Now, according to Rich Little, <laughs> the two groups are all of you and me. <laughs> but I calculate it rather differently. The first group of you are the people who came here with an ache in your heart and are going to leave the same way. The other group of you is so lost and distracted, you do not feel that ache. And my task tonight is to honor that ache in the heart. I want to tell you why you should be unusually compassionate to your preacher. Because if he or she is any good, let me tell you what their life is like. They get up every Sunday having just one thing to say, God. And the one thing they cannot say is God. And so they know that every Sunday for the rest of their preaching career will be a never-ending failure trying to say what cannot be said. And they also know that if even one time they succeeded, there would never be a reason for you to come back. <laughs> because having heard that one thing, there would be nothing left to say. And that's why they're so often depressed on Sunday nights, though few admit it. Because they know, I almost had it today. And then it got away. And you were rooting for them because if they had gotten it said, you wouldn't have to come back. <laughs> but here we are. And this fever dream, delirious, kooky text, which I am convinced is not entirely coherent. <laughs> and for very good reasons. Because John the Revelator is attempting to say what cannot be said. And so he gestures and he paints and he gives us this glorious picture. And we come away thinking, just almost had it that time. And then it slips away. Um, one of the problems with preaching this text is one is sorely tempted to spend all the time talking about all the stupidity that has been spewed over this text. There is probably no text of the Bible where more dumb things have been written than about this text. And now here I go. <laughs> okay, let me tell you the stuff I'm pretty sure about. Okay, now let's move on. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to offer a, a mystical interpretation of the text, um, more than I am a historical critical one, uh, because I just don't think it makes a lot of difference. Um, <laughs> In Revelation chapter 12, there is a war in heaven, and the war revolves around the birth of a baby. And this baby is going to rule. And the personification of evil, Satan, doesn't like this idea. And so he goes after Mother Israel who gives birth to this son and he goes after the son but he's not going to win this one. He fails and he's kicked out of heaven. In other words, chapter 12 is kind of a Christmas story. It's about the birth into the world of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and those opposing forces who would not see him reign. Uh, I really like the story about the little kid who, um, you know, they're in Bible class and it's close to Christmas. And I'm, I'm trying to do this Christmas thing because I can see how miserable you are. Okay, just think Christmas. All right. Uh. <laughs> He's drawing the, they're, they're drawing pictures of the nativity scene in Bible class because, uh, you, you know, that's what you do when you have little kids. And so he draws a picture, and there's baby Jesus, and there's Mary standing there, and there's lots of animals, and Joseph, and then there's this little fat guy. And the teacher says, who is that fat guy? And he says, oh, that's round John Virgin. Uh, <laughs> and if you really want a good nativity scene, you need to have a dragon in it. <laughs> because the picture is that Satan comes to make war on you because of his failure to to destroy the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the text is pretty clear about why he wants to make war on you because he's gotten kicked out of heaven, he's a spiteful loser, and his time is short. And that's really important because you want to give the devil his due, but you don't want to give him more than his due, and he's not due much. He's a spiteful loser who knows his time is short. And as God becomes incarnate in the world, evil becomes incarnate as well in these two beasts who the dragon takes for his allies. And uh, it turns out that this first beast, who's the head beast, uh, did you notice that? The first beast asserts power, the second beast supports the first beast, and the first beast happens to have a number. And his number is 666, which is the point where all the stupidity begins. Okay, um, so I, 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 you know, we've worked on 666 here a little bit. Let's, let's have that first slide. I think, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Okay, let's see. We got, we got letters that are numbers. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Let's see how it turns out. Q, purple, dinosaur. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing like traumatizing a kid. <laughs> oh, Mike Cope is actually responsible for that one. Uh, my, uh, my, my former TA, uh, Chris Woodruff, worked on another one this afternoon. Let's, let's, let's see if we can, we can keep working with 666. Rich <laughs> Australian. Let's see. Uh, now, if you really, if you really have time and nothing else to do, you can do a lot of things with with six six six. Um, and by the way, I think Barney has exactly as much credibility as saying it's Hitler, or Obama, or Ronald Reagan, or anybody else you want to choose. It really does miss the point, I think. Um, I think the problem is uh, 
we're not clear about what the riddle is. Now, I'll just tell you straight ahead, I think who the two beasts are couldn't be more obvious. And I think absolutely in the first century knew who they were. The first one is the Roman emperor who exerts all the power in the world, who, who, who claims to be deity. And the second beast is the, the cult of emperor worship that declares the emperor not just to be emperor, but to be God. That's who they are. And I really do think that, that anybody kind of within, within John's writing reach would have known that. So we kind of got the riddle wrong. The riddle is not who they are. The riddle is what number or name should we give them? Now, the way I've tried to illustrate this is is this. Have you noticed that most people name their pets too early? Uh, You should really have a dog a little while before you try to name it. You call it Einstein, it turns out, not so much. <laughs> you know, livestock would have been closer. This is also true, by the way, of children. Uh, <laughs> who, who you should wait a while to name, to, to, to give them a name appropriate to who they are. That's the riddle. What name or number should we give to the Roman emperor who claims to be God? And this is the number. A human number. Six, six, six. Because he can pretend all he wants. He can claim all he wants. The truth of the matter is, he's a man, he's just a man, he's a human, and like all things human, he's passing away. And so this text says, okay, I know when you look out your window, the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor look pretty powerful and like they're going to be there forever, but boy, you shouldn't mistake them for God because when they're on the trash heap of history, God's still going to be around. Now, the easiest application of this text, which is one I'll take, uh, I'm actually going to do something else. Um, The easiest application is the political one. But surely by now, most of us aren't confused about that. Surely by now, we know that the kingdom of heaven was doing very well before the United States came along, and it will be doing very well long after we're gone. Surely we know that. But just when I think we do, something like the bombing in Boston comes along, and unable to bear the pain of meaningless suffering, we have to create a story about being God's exceptional people. And I get worried all over again. Maybe we don't have it after all. Um, I, I, am, I am very politically interested in the same way that, that people who like the circus uh, enjoy going. <laughs> I find it highly entertaining and largely unimportant. But I want to go a step deeper. I want to give the mystical interpretation because the number 666 does not just hover over Caesar. It doesn't just hover over governments of all kinds. It hovers over every human endeavor. It reminds us that all things human have a number, and that number is a human number, six, six, six. And now I want to tell you about that ache in your heart. You have that ache in your heart, those of you who do, 
Because nothing finite in this world can satisfy your longing for God. And so you go to church and you think, okay, this might be the day. I go with that ache in my heart and I'm inevitably going to leave with it because the one thing that cannot be said that we keep, keep trying to say is God. And I go away thinking, I got this ache in my heart because that service wasn't too good. You've got that ache in your heart because you're longing for God and nothing human can fully fulfill that need. As the blessed Augustine said, our hearts are restless and they find no rest until they rest in you. But my great concern is for those of you who feel no ache because it means you become addicted to the finite. It means you become satisfied with something other than the infinite love of God, which is the only thing that can fill you up. It means you have fallen too in love with a job or a worship style or your own suffering and will not allow that ache to come in. And when we come together, what we do is make holy or hallow that ache because that's the sign we are not home yet. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in, in the Bible, you don't really get to look at God. You might catch a fleeting glimpse of his back. Um, and when I get done here in a minute or two, uh, we're going to sing something. And probably some of the great spiritual moments of your life have come over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years worshiping right here with these people. And you catch a glimpse of God's back. And there's that creeping voice that says, oh, almost had it that time. And then it slips away. It always does. And so you'll come back again. And if we ever get it, when we get it, we'll never come back. There will be no need. Because what we were created for, what we longed for, is now fully ours. I want to say something hard. The love of God protects us from nothing. It is the great lie of evangelical Christianity in America. The love of God will not protect you from cancer. The love of God will not protect you from the death of a child. The love of God will not protect you from terrorist attacks. The love of God will not protect you from addiction. The love of God will protect you from nothing. And he's like, what does the love of God do then? By the way, if you don't believe what I just said, I want to remind you, the story is about the cross. Remember? Protect us from anything, it throws us into the heart of suffering. There's no protection. What the love of God does is this. It says, whatever happens to you, good or bad, you are not defined by it. You're defined by one thing, and that is the infinite love of God. And everything else has a number, and that number is 666. And so, when we suffer, as we inevitably do, We draw close, dangerously close to the truth. And that is we have control of almost nothing in our lives or in this world. 
And that's why so often those moments of suffering turn into moments of revelation and realization because you know that everything has a number. It's 666. It's a human number. And there is nothing that can protect you. And all you do is wait patiently on the infinite love of God. And there are those of you, of us, who are much too defined by our supposed success. And we're no more defined by our successes than our failures. It's just another reflection of our addiction to the finite. You know, we we have this way now, and when you want to tell somebody who you are, you tell them what job you have, as if that defined you. You tell them what you do. And we usually try to make it sound better than it is. But we're not defined by those things. And when we come to church, and church behaves the way it should, it does not hide you from that. It recognizes the holiness of it. And this ache I describe should not be confused with sadness. They have little to do with each other. It is the ache that comes from knowing that that person I love will finally die. It's that ache that comes from knowing I have so little control of anything in this world, but despite what goes on here, the only thing that defines me is the infinite love of God in Jesus Christ. And I feel this ache because nothing in this world will satisfy my need for that love. There is another John whom I greatly admire, St. John of the Cross. Uh, I happen to believe that he is the second greatest thing that God ever created. The first is a perfectly baked, warm, gooey chocolate chip cookie. (laughs) But John of the Cross is second. And um, John points out to us how addicted we are to the things of this world. And what he tries to tell us is when you find your identity in the things of this world, you're settling. And that can never satisfy you because you weren't created for that. You were created for the infinite love of God. The Roman emperor isn't the only thing that bears the image of 666. All things human do. And everything that happens in this life that causes a little crack in our security a little crack in our sense of control is a gentle reminder of the humanness of all things and an appeal to that ache in our heart that says our hearts are restless and they find no rest until they rest in God. I want to conclude by a brief quote from one of my favorite theologians, uh, me. You really haven't hit the bottom until you start plagiarizing yourself. (laughs) I wrote these words a few years ago. It is five in the morning. I have that ache in my heart that is such a familiar companion. The longing for the time when we no longer see through a glass darkly, but face to face. The time when words such as these are no longer necessary. The time when we know firsthand what Jesus knows about the loving Father. Come.
Lord Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.